Once again, it's time for your questions. So just go ahead, wherever you're watching a video on YouTube, on our channel, just type in your question and we will answer them here. First up, Daniel Thomas. This is so cringeworthy. It's not actually a question, Daniel, but thank you. Uh, actually, what Daniel was talking about was the space games that we did on Mondays. And we did a couple of them with me and my son. And the response was kind of, meh. So I think we're going to keep doing this, but over on Twitch. And we'll keep playing it out, playing games on Twitch. So if you want to catch w us playing some games, maybe bring in some special guests, follow us on Twitch. And I'll link it up somewhere around here. Philip Hughes. Fraser, how far into the future do you believe it will be before humans have the ability to construct cylinder space colonies at Earth's Lagrange points? I've mentioned in previous videos that I personally am a big fan of O'Neill cylinders, some kind of rotating space station that can simulate artificial gravity and yet protect astronomers from space radiation through shielding. I still think it's a really good way to go. How long will it take for us to do it? It's more complicated than landing on the moon or landing on Mars and just burrowing into the soil, but it's you know, we've already built the International Space Station, so can we build a version two of the International Space Station, which is rotating that creates some artificial gravity? I think those kinds of things are within our reach. I, instead of building one out at a Lagrange point, let's start with building one in low Earth orbit like the space station, and then practice and get that perfect, and then move it to other places. So I personally, if I was in charge of space exploration worldwide, uh, I would move on to building a rotating space station, just like we had in 2001. How long? I don't know. Uh, we could do this in the next 10 years to start and then just keep making them better and better, attaching more to it. Stephanie, can life exist in a galaxy with an active nucleus, a quasar? Life can absolutely exist in a galaxy that has a quasar. Uh, we actually did a video about this and the that if the, the quasar, the, or the supermassive black hole at the center of the Milky Way started actively feeding and turned into a quasar, which might happen when Andromeda collides with the Milky Way, we wouldn't even be able to see it from here on Earth. Another theory that's even more interesting is that in fact, uh, one source of sort of star formation, one of the causes of star formation is these supermassive black holes actively feeding, they put out these kind of jets of material, and that material may rain back down into the galaxy and contribute and help trigger star formation. So it might very well be that we actually need quasars to help kick off some of the star formation in a galaxy. So uh, yeah, for sure, no problem. Leon's Peniel. Uh, Fraser, do you think in the future we will evolve to digital beings? I personally do think that, actually. I am, I am sort of... I kind of do believe in sort of this concept of the singularity that as the computers are advancing faster and faster, we will eventually merge with our computers and head off into the universe. I, I kind of feel like that is, you know, our brains are just meat computers. And so it makes sense to me that as the computers get faster and faster and faster, they will eventually become as good as our brains. And we will start by augmenting our brains, helping with things like uh, um, Parkinson's disease or Alzheimer's and then over time we'll just commit more and more of our brain power through silicon and eventually we'll just become uh, sort of one with the computers kind of like Ray Kurzweil says so I do sort of feel like if, if computers just keep advancing faster and faster then there will come a time now it might be that we, we choose to live as meat <laughs> but that we will have robotic companions and, and artificial intelligence out there that does our exploring for us, that really expands out into the universe. So whether we stay here, it'll be our companions, our robotic buddies that actually do the exploring for us. Those beings of sort of intelligence will be out there. Joycey VDV, could the Death Star be a Dyson Sphere? No, the, the Death Star's too small. It's only, I don't know, like 100 kilometers across. It's itty bitty. A Dyson Sphere is so big. Keep in mind, right? A Dyson Sphere is the same size as the distance from the Earth to the Sun, which is about 150 million 
kilometers. So you imagine this sphere that goes around, or a cloud of, of space stations that goes around the whole sun, where the radius of this is 150 million kilometers. That's so much bigger than a, than a Death Star, it, it boggles the imagination. You need to take all of the planets, in all of the asteroids, all of the comets, all of the material in the whole solar system, and turn it into a shell that's like 40 centimeters thick, all the way around the entire sun. It's, it's just a whole other level of scale. James Craver, could we land on Phobos or Deimos? What's the closest we've been to them? We definitely could land on Phobos or Deimos. Phobos would be a little easier. It's a little bit bigger, uh, a little more mass. But as we saw with Rosetta, it's a very difficult thing to do to land on an object that has so little mass. So uh, anyone who does land on Phobos is going to kick themselves off into space if they're not really super careful. So, but the nice thing about Phobos is it acts as a great way station. You could send a spacecraft to Phobos, have it be a space station, and then people could go from Phobos down to Mars and back up again. So it's a really great kind of halfway point between the Earth and Mars. It's not obviously physically halfway there, but it is sort of with the amount of energy that you need. It's a really great refueling station, a place to kind of rest. But as we saw in Doom, you know, it could also be a portal to hell. So you got to be really careful. El Galicki, India success equals 100%. When we did this episode on the Mars curse, I talked about all the American successes and failures and all of the European failures, but uh, I didn't specifically mention the success of the Indian mission, the orbiter that arrived just a couple of years ago. So absolutely, congratulations, India. Do it again. Let's see some more, like just no more, no failures at all, please. Aubrey Griffin. Of course, the downside of the ITN is that it's slow as balls. You're absolutely right. It is very slow. The problem is you've got these Lagrange points and you have to get to the Lagrange point, kind of lose all your velocity, and then drift out of your Lagrange point to the next trajectory. And the whole process takes a long, long time. But if you're out in space and you're in some O'Neill cylinder and the whole thing's just going very slow and you don't really care, then it's the way to go. Marcel Yan Kriegsman. Used to love astronomy, and now I'm a database administrator. Hey, that's me. In our most recent episode of the Weekly Space Hangout, we were talking about this, how if you love computers and you also love astronomy, there's actually a lot of demand for people like that in the field of astronomy. So take a good look at it. There's a, a lot of astronomy these days is databases, is gathering through these enormous surveys that have been done looking for certain kinds of information, looking for quasars or looking for certain kinds of, of stellar objects. There's a ton of need for computer scientists. So if you feel like you're a computer scientist and you missed your chance of being an astronomer, the reality is you actually can go brush up on some of your astronomy skills and take those computer skills and help out in astronomy. Hanno Evard. Could we seal up a lava tube on the moon and generate a self-sustaining ecosystem in there? One of the most amazing things about the moon is that there are these lava tubes that have been discovered. They found access points to the lava tubes that are under on the moon. And some of the thinking is that these lava tubes could actually be like kilometers tall. You could fit a whole city in some of these lava tubes. So we need to do more research, find these lava tubes on the moon, figure out ways that we could close them up, and they would make a very ideal place to live on the moon. It'd be, it'd be pretty sad and depressing because you're in the sort of underneath the surface of the moon, but I think it would be a great idea, so we should totally do it. OxyClean. How did you get into science in the first place? Who were your adults in the science world? Can you describe what age you were when you felt astonished by everything around you? Well, my background is in computer science, but I was into science as a little kid. I read science books. I had a telescope when I was a little kid. I would say the person who got me first into science was Spock from Star Trek. I'm not kidding. Yeah, no. I. I really enjoyed how they covered the science in Star Trek. And like a lot of people that are in this field, Star Trek and science fiction like that was a huge influence on us on getting, you know, choosing our careers. So uh, I think I was into science from, a, from an early, early age and I would have been watching YouTube videos as a child, like my kids do actually, all about science. So uh, just like you, I hope, I got into it really early. Science fiction was a big influence, and here I am today. Calm Terror. If we did colonize Mars, how do we communicate with them while the sun is between Mars and Earth? There are times when 
the sun is in between Earth and Mars, and so we can't communicate with them directly. But in those situations, we would relay signals. There would be other places, other spacecraft, and we would send a message to the spacecraft, and then the spacecraft would send the message to the back to Earth, and that's how we would communicate. It would add to the talk time, which would suck. So if you're playing some kind of video game and the, you know, you got, you're already sick of the 20 minute lag between all of your moves, it would get even longer with that. But it would be possible to communicate. All right, once again, thanks everybody for sending in your questions. It's a lot of fun, I really enjoy them. And I really look forward to looking through all the questions that you've got, all the comments you've got, and uh, tackling them in future question shows. So wherever you're watching a video, even this one, just type in your question and either I will tackle it in this question show or turn it into a bigger episode. And most of the time I type in there anyway and give you a quick answer. So keep them coming. Thanks.